very much to everyone in the Red Cross team in particular for putting this really timely and fantastic summit together. I just want to say a few words about collaborative crisis mapping and use Haiti as sort of the springboard to draw some preliminary conclusions that I'd love to get your thoughts on and, and have a conversation about. I don't know if I'm too far now. So some 10 days after the earthquake, uh, Craig at FEMA, who is the head of FEMA, was here giving a presentation this morning, noted that the USHA Haiti crisis map of Haiti was the most up-to-date and comprehensive map available to the humanitarian community. And if you went to haiti.ushahaiti.com, you'd see something like this. And in fact, if you zoomed out, you'd see hundreds and even thousands of individual reports that had been filtered and carefully geolocated on this map. And if you zoomed in, just like the screenshot shows, you just see the density of reporting that took place, so much so that even at that level, we had a cluster of reports because otherwise the map would be literally covered in red. Now, who was behind this massive mapping effort? But was not the United Nations in New York, nor the United Nations agencies in Port-au-Prince, or the Red Cross, or any other humanitarian organization, for that matter. It all started here, in this living room, with a handful of graduate students from the Fletcher School in snowy Boston at Tufts University. During the first few days, several dozen showed up, but then days later, the movement sort of grew and we got more and more graduate students and not only graduate students, we got undergraduate students at Tufts University and not only in Boston, but in, in London, in Geneva, in Montreal, in Portland, Oregon, in Washington, D.C., people coming together and not only students, but also the Haitian diaspora in Miami and in Boston coming together, creating this live map of Haiti and maintaining it over the period of several weeks. And then by the end of that first week, Thousands more of volunteers across the world came together, connected by social media, connected by social uh, networks online, to translate tens of thousands of text messages that were coming in from the disaster-affected population in Haiti, necessarily in Haitian Creole, and translating these text messages within minutes, and then locating them and adding them to the Usha Haiti map, creating this live map. And if you put you know, some of the faces behind these dots, you have a human story here. You have individuals with their own lives, with their own responsibilities, their work, their concerns, their families, who still find the time, make the time to come together and help, you know, within their own social networks to help thousands of people um, from thousands of miles away who they'll never actually ever meet. But yet they do come together and, and do that. And where do they get that information from? Well, from this new informa information ecosystem that we're all talking about today, the social data, the social um, media. Not only SMS, right, but the first sources of information that we had that very evening when we launched that map was Twitter and Facebook. For the first 12, 24 hours, a lot of the information came from there. And it wasn't only Flickr as well and pictures and video, but it was also the mainstream media looking online at BBC and CNN and watching television, right? So traditional media and listening to the radio. All this came together to try and help and populate the, the map of Haiti. And so what would happen is these volunteers would comb this information ecosystem and take out reports, actionable reports like this one that came originally from a text message about two individuals being trapped. So they would add a title, structure it, and then, and then geo-reference it. And these hundreds of people in the U.S. and around the world did this day and night for days and days, morning, evening, night, over and over and over. And they weren't getting paid. They were doing this because they wanted to help and the social media and these free and open source mapping platforms like Ushahidi provided a space to help. It was not that people were ecstatic about the tools. People have already always been interested in helping, but now you have tools there in place to actually materialize that want, that human want to try and help others in need. So what about response? And we've mentioned this. Susie and Trevor just mentioned the idea that now 75% of people expect a response when they post something on, on social media. Well, in my opinion, I think what we need to do is combine this crowdsourcing, which I just sort of described in action, with something that I call crowd feeding. And by crowd feeding, what I mean is getting that information that comes from the crowd and feeding it directly back to the crowd. It's, it's information sort of from the crowd, by the crowd, for the crowd, because 
they probably need that information just as much, if not more, than the first responders, right? Who are really the first responders, in fact? It is the disaster-affected populations themselves. So I do think we have some interesting examples of this showing up, right? Just a month after Haiti took place, right here in Washington, D.C., one of the largest snowstorms to hit the city basically paralyzed um, many of its residents. And PICNet, together with the Washington Post, put up this Ushahidi map within days. And what was really neat about this, it allowed residents themselves to put themselves in the map and say, hey, I need help. This is what I'm, I have a problem. I need some help with this and that. But in a very interesting move, they also allowed other people, other residents to say, I can help. I want to help. I have the resources to help. So what this in effect created was a sort of a, a crowdsourcing marketplace where those in need could find those with resources and vice versa. Because as we know, and as Susie and Trevor suggested, Disaster response officials are not going to be available at every street, at every corner, at every neighborhood. They're not always going to be there. There's not enough of them. But the crowd will always be there. By definition, the crowd is always there, and the crowd is many. So I think what we need to think about with this crowdsourcing and crowdfeeding is finding ways to connect the crowd with each other. And what we see in an even higher scale right now, over the past week, some colleagues at Global Voices set up a new Shahidi map in response to the fires. This is the largest crowdsourcing exercise that Russia has ever seen. They're getting hundreds of thousands of hits on, on the website. And again, what the model, the model they used with the crowdsourcing and crowdfeeding. Not map where the fires are, but allow people who are impa impacted, affected by the fires, to map themselves and say, I need help. This is what's just happened to me. And again, allowing others to say, I can help. I have an extra car. I have food. I can uh, house two extra people. Because sometimes there'll be a fire in a city, but maybe 20 miles away, the next city won't be impacted. So not all of society is impacted in the same way. And the parts that are less affected can help regenerate those that are affected, almost like a biological or ecological system. And I really think that's one of the ways that we need to think about. Clearly, the emergency responders and professionals are not going to be able to be there all the time. So with that in mind, we, well, just a few words in closing, actually. This is sort of the model that we've all sort of come to know that we think we agree is no longer viable. Um, and we have this other model now that I think many of us have in mind where this is perhaps the role of citizens in disaster response, but I think actually this doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, I think there's another story that's going on based on I think what we've seen in Haiti. I think this is what really is going on. I think it's social circles, networks that are already existing before a disaster that connect, that already connected, sorry, and then connect with other social circles that they wouldn't otherwise have been connected with, thanks to social media, networking tools, and the Ushidi platform, and so on. So it's passionate individuals who are connected, and their efforts are now being aggregated and magnified in this way. So to finish, what we did because of all this um, is launch something called CrowdMap earlier this week. On Monday, in fact. And CrowdMap is simply a new Shahidi service that's free that allows anybody to set up their own map within minutes. You don't have to install anything. You don't need any kind of technical skills or what have you. And within hours of our launching the service on Monday, some colleagues in Pakistan set up their own CrowdMap in response to the floods that were taking place. And they're now working with the media in Pakistan as well as the telcos looking to set up a short code just like we did in Haiti. And we don't know these individuals, but they're clearly well connected and they've gotten in touch and they're moving things forward. They're ordinary, average people, just like most of us, I think, uh, in this world. So if you want to learn more, this is my last slide. Um, please come to this crisis mapping conference um, in October in Boston. You can look us up at crisismappers.net. We're going to be talking a lot more about exactly these issues that have been brought up. Thank you very much.